Bhagavato, Parahato, Sama, Sambuddhasa. Homage to the blessed, noble, and perfectly enlightened one. Ammo Sadanto Suchedoye Alahadi Sameao San Putoshe Ammo Sadanto Suchedoye Alahadi Sameao San Putoshe Wushan Shen Shen Wei Supreme and wondrous Dharma, subtle and profound, rarely is encountered, even in millions of eons. But now we see and hear it and accept it reverently. May we truly understand the Buddha's actual meaning. Venerable Master, Dharma friends, good evening. Welcome to our Sutra Lecture. To all those of you fans of the Avatamsaka, fans of the Flower Garland, we're here again. It is uh, June 15th. The Ides of June? No, there's no such thing. Middle of June, here in Berkeley, California, at 7.30 p.m., and I am not a silver screen. I'm not a TV monitor. There's actual, you know, you punch it. There you go. Yeah, 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 real. And I know there are people listening to me virtually on Sunday, June 16th, down in Gold Coast, southeastern Queensland, Australia. How about that? And because of their kindness, folks get to listen to what I'm saying in Mandarin, in China, and around the world. So, welcome to our Sutra Lecture tonight. We're going to be investigating the Flower Garland Sutra. So, if that's what you've come to hear, you're in the right place. This airplane is heading to Pittsburgh, and at 30, we're cruising at 35,000. No, that's another story. So, uh, let us begin on the front cover of your Sutra text. You've got a title of Buddhas and Bodhisattvas of the Flower Garland Assembly. And I need a new mandolin pick since I just misplaced the one that I wanted as soon as I came downstairs. Luckily, I carry a bag of mandolin picks, so I'm okay. There we go. And uh, with my lovely national resophonic mandolin, we can use a melody to invoke the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, the Flower Garland Assembly, and the name of the sutra itself. And this, in fact, I don't know if people are aware, um, that's our melody. This particular recitation in Chinese was what I recited with every bow that I made for two and a half years and then for another six months after that at City of 10,000 Buddhas, um, invoking the presence of the sutra and the assembly. So um, later, actually this melody came from once we arrived at CTTB and this passed on through me and, and Marty Verhoeven, Hung Chao, to the whole assembly. 
and it became the when you chao shan, you know, at CTDB, this is what you do. Uh, this this melody. So we did it kind of tunelessly when we bowed. Uh, the wind was often just blowing in our face, and you couldn't hear any melody anyway. So so it's. Uh, That's it. Ready? Want to do it? Now, that, this is the external part. The internal part is we're inviting uh, wise, incredible, infinite, sagely spiritual beings to attend. Here we go. Namo da fang guang po hua yin jing hua yin hai po pu sa text, we are going to turn now to, this is, this is the ninth stage, oh, eighth and ninth stage. So together we've got quite a booklet growing. We're not quite done, we still have to add the verses that conclude the ninth stage. Uh, we need to turn to page 80 and 81. The Basha, Basha, 80 and 81. And so, uh, a shout out, an appreciative note. Today was the first day of our Berkeley Buddhist Monastery Family Camp Day Number One, uh, 2019, of two days. And wowee, it was this place rocking, rocking the monastery today uh, with uh, kids and parents and monks, all six of us. We have six monastics here at the Berkeley Monastery now. Our novice, uh, Mr. Yap, has become Qinliang Shami. So all of us were there, and we divided up into children, youth, and adults, and had three different, uh, three different groups gathering at the same time. And wow, uh, lots, of, lots of true talk happened today. And uh, then at the end, we, we gathered everybody together and sent off the day with a word. Everybody contributed a word, 50 plus. How many people total did we count? 50 some folks here. And, and the, the dominant word, and co- there's a tendency to just say what the last person said, especially if you're eight years old, you, you know, you just say. But a lot of, uh, these are American kids now. And a lot of them said, happy, happy, joy. You know, and so we heard a lot of that. Uh, gratitude and things like that. Pretty good. Pretty good. Yeah. What was it? Fun? Yeah? Smile? Yeah. Yeah, it was good. It was good. We have another whole day tomorrow. So, um, we're uh, rolling on that energy tonight to look at the... Um, but the last paragraph we finished last week was, if you start at the bottom, it's line one, two, three, four, five, six. Shindo huan shi. Phil, see. Yes, line number six. Niger. 
uh, let's see. Yes, that's right. So, Niger, Buka Shuo, Buka Shuo, Shijia, right? Already got that one, line six. In the English, it's second paragraph from the bottom, third paragraph from the top. Okay, want to read with me? Now, because I'm here and we don't have that jet lag from up above to down under, um, we'll do call and response. I'll give you a line, you give it back to me. Ready? Here we go. Niger, Buka Shuo, Buka Shuo, Shijia. Man Zhong Zhong Sheng Pusa Jianung Sui Chi Xin Yao Sui Gun Sui Jie Ar Wei Shuo Fa Cheng Fu Shen Li Guang Zuo Fu Shi Pu Wei Yi Chie Zuo Suo Yi Hu. Sorry, one more time. Zuo Suo Yi Hu. Alrighty, over to the right. Now we're on the third paragraph from the top. We're going to read this together. This is in unison together, reading together. Ready? Here we go. Suppose there were enough sentient beings to fill indescribably many numbers of world systems. Comma, take a breath. The Bodhisattva would still be able to speak the Dharma in accordance with their mind's delights and according to their individual faculties and understandings. Period. Full stop. Take a breath. Receiving the Buddha's awesome spiritual inspiration, he would carry out the Buddha's work on a vast scale and act as a place of reliance for all beings everywhere. All right. Just, I know there's a lot of uh, new folks who have not heard this chunk of the sutra before. And what's going on is our bodhisattva is in training. He's a ninth stage bodhisattva, very close to completion in his work, in his training, or her training, could be a female. And his particular skill that he's training out is how to speak so people understand. He has become a da a uh, da, if you translate it as great, great is one of those words that has been overused, and because it's overused, it loses its power. You know the other one of those words that this has happened to? The word awesome. Right? And, uh, David Rounds, our dear departed uh, colleague and, and mentor, he gave the best example. Awesome, right? Full, full of awe. You know, just when you see something that's awesome, you're supposed to go, oh, like that. You know, it's like you're, you're, you're almost in shock because of the, the grandeur, the majesty of it, the power of it, right? So <laughs> David said, we can't use awesome anymore. Awesome's totally been deconstructed. It's no longer got any weight to it. He says, I was in Starbucks, and I, was ask, I asked for a half-calf grand latte, and the guy behind the counter said, awesome. He said, nah, it's totally been devalued. So when awesome is used to describe your, your Starbucks order, your coffee order, can't use it to mean what it used to mean. Another one of those words is great. Right? Da, Fa he's a great Dharma master. Da in Chinese means big. And we have so many words in English that would suit, that would fit, meaning like grand or outstanding would be okay too, or awesome, if only, you know, or uh, impressive, or qualified. Any of those words would work for da. Big is size, right? But in this case, it doesn't mean he's like a XXL. That's not that kind of Dharma master, an overweight Dharma master, or a massive Dharma master. No, it's not his physical size. It has to do with the quality of his teaching or her teaching. Da here refers to skill and virtue and power and eloquence. All right? Whatever you want to use for da, that's what he is now. He is a da fa shi, teacher of dharma. He's, you can even use the word effective. He's good at it. She's good at it. All right? Instead of going back and forth, I'll just pick he. But anybody who wants to add she, go ahead. He is a da fa shi, and he is 
uh, because of the training that he has gotten, something has changed recently, which is when this Dafasher sits on that seat and you all go, will the Sangha with great virtue out of compassion request Dharma? The audience, in this case would be you, for example, decide that they have a lot of doubts. They have a lot of questions. And each of them, and the sutra, because it's the Avatamsaka, magnifies it to this ex- incredible extent. Each of them poses questions, dharma questions, personal questions, difficult problems to the speaker, who is the dafasher sitting right there. All at once, each in different languages, without pause, the bodhisattva, who is now prepared, he's now been trained, it says, in a single thought of his mind, responds with a single sound and solves each of their problems individually according to how they can understand it to their own languages and makes them happy. That's it. And then it gave us a whole bunch of situations where that just gets bigger and bigger in his capacity. Now, you can hear that and think, oh, that's, that's a fun chapter in our book, you know. Was, was that on Sci-Fi Channel? You know, is that like, did the American Association of Psychology review that? Who does that? You know, you can doubt it or belittle it or make it kind of long ago and far away or make it fiction. This is only exists in some author's imagination. That would be to miss the power of this text. This is a textbook of the human mind developed to an unusual level. Unusual only because most people haven't done the groundwork. If everybody did the groundwork, if this was required of spiritual training, we'd all know that this circuit, this software, lies in our nature, waiting to be activated, waiting to be booted up. Right? And I've said that every week, and I guess, do you all get that? Does that make sense? Anybody have a problem with that? I just did a Doug Powers, didn't I? Anybody? Y'all... Y'all, y'all, y'all get that much? Right? Because I guess it's, you know, it's like, I guess so. It makes sense. And that's been one of our standards ever since we entered this, the, the 10 stages chapter is talking about it as a textbook, as an instruction manual. Same thing when you buy your new riding lawnmower and you get past all the warnings, you know, so you can operate your riding lawnmower you need to read that, that book. Your new vacuum cleaner. Got your new vacuum cleaner? How do you empty the bag? Right? Well, you better dig into the book. Right? This is one of those books. How to transform a living being into a da fa shi, great Dharma master. Okay, so that's our intro. That's our warm-up. How are we doing? We ready? Launch into tonight? Okay, here we go. This is one of a series. So the Niger means... Furthermore, okay, suppose we had enough sentient beings to fill indescribably many numbers of world systems. What's a world system? We live in one. Multiply our world system, we could just say our solar system for reference sake, multiply it by bukashwa bukashwa, which is a number in Buddhism, meaning myriad, right? Infinite numbers of them. Sentient beings fill those worlds. The Bodhisattva could speak Dharma in accordance to each of their mind's delights. All right? He could. And you can too. That's the point. This is not science fiction. And according to their faculties and understandings, make them happy. Different languages. He could speak Vietnamese, Cantonese, Hakka, Hokkien, Fujian. Minnanhua, Guoyu, Putonghua, you know, Guanhua, right? English, he could talk Texan, you know, and Boston, party, parky car at the garage. And everybody could go, whoa, you're really fluent in my language, right? In my dialect. Receiving the Buddha's awesome spiritual inspiration, this one, the Buddha gives him a boost. He would carry out the Buddha's work on a vast scale and act as a place of reliance for all beings everywhere. Okay, 
that came back to me this week, because we just touched on it last week, acting as a place of reliance. That's a, a role that our Bodhisattva now is qualified to serve, to fill in. What's a place of reliance? Um, I've, I've told this story before and it bears retelling because it's so tender and tragic at the same time. Uh, we had a, a death in our community years back now, maybe almost, not, maybe a decade. Yeah, a decade ago. And it was tragic. Uh, it was actually a, a robbery and the, the bad guys were caught. But it was a case of uh, industrial espionage, right? People were stealing chips before they got carved when they were still fresh out of the the baking, and they were still silicon, worth a lot of money. And in the process, uh, one of the, one of the uh, executives in the company who related to our community um, was shot and killed. And he had just, in, the la- in that year, uh, gone to China from Silicon Valley and found a wife, married and brought her back and they were she was adjusting to life in northern california he was adjusting to life as a married man and one of the interesting things was the man the victim of the robbery was a buddhist and the wife was a red guard <laughs> she was she'd been raised in a time when religion was just not possible it was not available to you you know, for a, a nation at the time. I won't, you all know the details. So, so she uh, just, you know, patiently watched her husband uh, go bow to the Buddha and use beads. And she's like, you know, don't do that. All right. So he's he's dead, and uh, we were called on to do the funeral, to do the, the whole shir, right? The, the things you do when you want to send someone on to the, in their journey. And uh, so we had a combination. We did a service at Gold Sage and then a uh, mortuary for, the, for the, the body. And for the Buddhists, what, what we do... Um, when someone has passed on, is we say, uh, think about the journey of the one who died. On their behalf, recite. We're, our, our story that we use for the end of life is the Pure Land story, right? Amitabha. You recite the name of the Buddha and those who believe who vow to go there and who practice are reborn in the Pure Land. That's our story, and it's a good one. It works. Okay. So everybody is in the custom of holding on to your grief until the soul is crossed over. Then we get on with the process of grieving, right? But the grieving part is clearly for you. The reciting part is for the departed. So, if you've ever been to a funeral where I have been to funerals where the pastor loses it and says, God, why did you take this son? He was too young. You know, and there's anger expressed at an unjust God, you know, and there's, okay, you've been to the, well, Buddhist funerals are like, People are, Namu Omi Tofo, go to the Pure Land quick. You know, may you be crossed over safely through the, the, the choppy waters of samsara to the Pure Land, like that. It's, it's very dignified, and boy, it's a soul-filling, and uh, 
you can feel the sincerity because why? Of course there's emotions. There's this loss and tearing away at the time of death. But because we have this strong, expedient means of chaodu, right? To take a cross through the, the power of the vows of Amitabha, Buddhist funerals tend to be really uh, uplifting. And people who come in skeptical or, de- or just broken come out feeling resolved and focused. And I want to help them get to the pure land. I care about them enough that I'm going to recite for them. Instead of indulging my, oh, I don't know where they've gone. Oh, what am I going to, you know. There's time for that. It's not that we don't grieve. Grieving is necessary. It's a healing part of the process. But not now, right? Okay, so that's the background. So here we are, we're in the funeral home, and all the Buddhists who know the man are there reciting, and you could feel the power, you know, let's all get together. All right, so we, uh, they left the coffin open before the cremation, and we all walked around the coffin, came to the wife. She got to the coffin, and I was standing there ringing the bell. Um, all right. She came up to the coffin, looked down at her husband, and I'd never seen a living human being lose their bones before. She melted like water on the floor and sobbed and wailed and grieved with, as if the floor was going to open and carry her away. She had nothing to rely on. She had no place of reliance whatsoever. And before that, she'd just been tough, you know. <laughs> well, she got to the realization that her husband had died, brand new, married recently, you know. She melted on the floor. And I just have this visceral memory of this woman turning into a puddle of grief. In, the word inconsolable could not console her. She what, didn't want to hear it. She just wanted to sob. And here are the Buddhists with what? A place of reliance. In the high waves of birth and death, Amitabha's vows are a place of reliance. And all the Buddhists who know the story and who believe in it were going, Namo Amitabha. Go to the Pure Land soon. It was the heart behind it, right? Here was this woman. And her relatives came. They come from, they picked her up and she just melted through their fingers back on the floor. She had no bones left. And it took minutes to get her picked up and taken out to the room with Kleenexes and relative. you know. What a difference between acting as a place of reliance for all beings and just not having it, right? What is it? Faith. It's called faith. Faith in Amitabha's vows and the power of practice. So what a difference, my goodness. So, and I've seen, as I mentioned, um, when uh, sometimes belief in the Savior isn't enough if it's not really deep. And I've seen... uh, Non-Buddhist funerals devolve into anger and fist shaking. And, you know, how could you be so unfair? You know, and that's sad because there's nowhere to put that. It doesn't. It just comes back in your face. You know. So having a place of reliance when you need it is really important. Really, really important. What do you turn to for your strength? What is your rock that upon which you stand. Jesus is my rock. <laughs> That's a wonderful teaching. And boy, if you have faith in Jesus, it will hold you up. It's a rock. Right? So it's better to have faith in something than faith in nothing. Amen. Amen. Can I get an amen? amen. Can I get a bodhisvaha? bodhisvaha. Hallelujah. <laughs> right. Praise Buddha. Okay. For the Pusa Fu Gong Jing Jin Chang Jo Zhi Ming, let's do that line. Disciples of the Buddha, when this Bodhisattva increases his vigor, he develops his wisdom. 
Now, some of you alert translators are going to look over and go, wait a minute, Chengzhou Zhi Ming. And we talked about it. Our, our translation staff talked about that. What it says word for word is accomplishes his wisdom light. And we thought, yeah, probably Ming here. Okay, students of Mandarin, look at that last word there. M-I-N-G, Ming, right, second tone. The character rewards analysis. It's the sun and the moon together. Er, yue. Together, make up the word Ming, second tone, right? Which translates often as light. Right, Guang Ming. But Ming, half the time, also translates as understanding. Ming Bai. The light of understanding. Sometimes it translates as clarity. Right? Jing Ming. So he's clear about it, he understands it, he illuminates it, or I am clear about it. It's not entirely, we don't have enough input here to decide which of those three meanings is the one here. Now, zhi hui de guang ming, the light of wisdom, is a thing that, that is described in the Avatamsaka. In this particular sutra, light plays a big part, it comes back all the time. The idea that, they say, our nature, uncovered, shines. What do we call it in the world? Charisma. When somebody just radiates. And sometimes you can accomplish it with makeup, right? Skillful makeup shines, you know, glitter and stuff. Uh, glass, glass in your lipstick or something. That's not it. That's not what we're talking about. So, we talked about it. We decided that what the Bodhisattva accomplishes here is his wisdom. That probably Zhi Ming here is better served simply by saying Zhi Hui. So, the Bodhisattva is more vigorous here and his wisdom continues to grow. Now what I am interested in here is the idea that this Bodhisattva, if he were a high school student, he's like only got a few credits left before graduation. He's pretty much, pretty much done. He's in his final semester for sure and does not stop. In fact, studies harder than ever. Vigor, constant vigor. And that's a hallmark of our Avatamsaka Bodhisattva is the continuous effort, unceasing effort Fu Gung means even more hardworking. Now, um, vigor is, we haven't talked about vigor for quite a while, and it's, it's a good thing to investigate. What is, what is Buddhist vigor? Does it mean clench, tighten up, frown, get a line between your eyebrows? Is that, that Buddhist vigor? For some people, um, that doesn't sustain. Tightening up, coming at it harder. You can only hold that until you get tired, until you're exhausted. Then you have to fall back to whatever you were doing before that. What I prefer to understand as Buddhist vigor is what Shurfa would say to us, go long, you would say. Yong chang yuan de yan guang. Yong chang yuan de xin yuan. Right? Go long. Use long-term vigor which is to say, how am I going to be cultivating tomorrow? How am I going to be cultivating this time next year? How am I going to be cultivating 10 years from now? Plan ahead and go at the pace that you can sustain. Naturally, if you keep going and you finish today's homework, today's gong ke, tomorrow will happen and the vigor grows. Because why? We are progressing by getting rid of the darkness. Right? So, continuous training carries us further than heroic efforts on the weekend. Okay, how about you meditators, you mindfulness guys and girls? How's, how's your meditation going? Um, my experience is 
a little bit every day takes us further than nothing from Monday to Friday and then heroic stuff on Saturday and Sunday. Right? Vigorous on the weekends. Um, that was Master Hua's method, was do it every day. Take your meditation the way you do what? The way you brush your teeth. What if you don't brush Monday to Friday, but brush three times on Saturday and Sunday? Every, three times each day, on, well, your teeth are clean on Monday, but then Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, you know, plaque. And uh, car dental caries, you have tooth decay. So you brush your teeth every day, and guess what? You can be 50 and 60 years old and still have all your teeth. They don't fall out. Boy, back in the days before dental hygiene, people lost their teeth by age 30. It was a common thing because the concept of brushing your teeth didn't, didn't occur. That's a, that's a relatively... All you pre-dental people, where's Andrew? We have our distinguished dentist in training who will tell you that. That uh, uh, brushing your teeth, the dental hygiene as your job, is a relatively new phenomenon. I think the Second World War was when it became you know, popular. And uh, by goodness, we keep our teeth. You know, we don't have to, to exchange. Uh, <laughs> here I am. Cliff, you're translating into Chinese. Am I off into the, wood, the weeds here? Do I need to come back to the, to the main? Okay. Yashua. All right. So, um, vigor is sustainable vigor. You make effort that you can keep up every day just the way we brush our teeth. Every day, a little bit, and a gleam. Vigor, meditate every day. Find a time which, that's good. And good meditation habits really count. All you meditators, all you mindfulness types, right? I have friends who, because they have cats, don't meditate in the house, but they do have a minivan out in the garage, so they go out in the minivan, slide the door shut, Oh, money, pay me. Um. They, where do they, what's the, uh, they, they activate one of their, uh, one of their 1,200 mindfulness apps on their phone, right? For the timer. Boom. I have a wonderful meditation timer right here, right? It's got all these great boom, choices of bells. I have one with eight different bells that I can ring. And so you set those out in your van, in your minivan. The cats can't bother you. Turn your, turn your phone off otherwise so they can't ring. And you're not going to be tempted to check your Instagram at the time when you're meditating. By golly, your four-wheeled bodhimanda, four-wheeled chantang, zendo, right? Perfect place to meditate, my goodness. And not recommended to light incense. You light incense, people will think you're smoking dope out there, right? So... Not that I just never, never mind. That's a reference from the '60s. All right, so you don't have to light incense. But it, the thing about the van is that the day's distractions won't find you there, and that's a really good place. And our our friend uh, talk about sustainable vigor, right? Stephen, Stephen, our our uh, tireless meditation instructor here at the Berkeley Buddhist Monastery. He has students who've been following him for, for decades. St what does Stephen say? Stephen says, okay, now, if you want to study with me, you have to promise. You have to commit to your practice. And they're going, well, I don't know I want to commit to your practice. What, what does it mean? I want you to commit to promise to meditate for 18 seconds a day. Say it again. 18 seconds. Can you promise me? Well, yeah. No problem. 18 seconds, I can handle it. You promise. I promise. Okay. So, what's the thinking behind it? Of course, that's a shan chao fang bian. That's a skillful expedient. If you take it seriously and break out of your trance or whatever you're doing and say, okay, I'll give them 18 seconds. By the time you're there sitting, you're not going to, oh, 18 seconds is up, okay, I'm done. You're going to sit, right? But it's that commitment to do it. 
that Stephen is aiming for. It's a skillful means. And everybody laughs at it because, of course, you can do 18 seconds, you can do 18 minutes, you can do 18 years of meditation every day. So, it works. It's, it's a skillful means. It's based on observation of human behavior. Right? Once you're there sitting, you're, you're not going to quit after 18 seconds. So, but you promise, you commit. Right? So, okay. So, sustainable meditation wins, carries you down the way. And after a while, you don't have to work so hard. Why? My body and mind, my system goes, oh, thank you. I'm home. Our system appreciates my good roots meditating it. Right? We meditate ourselves. <laughs> we put ourselves in that new connection, the new circuitry of eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and three kinds of mind, sixth, seventh, and eighth consciousness, integrated. Instead of scattered. Oh yeah? Really? No way. Oh yeah? Huh? Yeah. Ah. You know, it's like, no. Ding! Connected. Thank you. When we do that, there's, after a while, not right away, there's this feeling of, I'm back. I recognize myself. That doesn't exist. The, con collect the, the constructed self, I'm, I'm back. So the thing that's out there dancing on the winds of karma is, it's me for a minute and then it's something else. And everything I focus on, my eyes go out, my ears go out, my, I'm not myself until I... And of course it's a phony self, but it's the one that allows me to transform, to transcend. So right? Every day, every day. Anybody learning a skill, let's say piano, right? How do you possibly develop piano gung fu without putting your fingers on the keys every day? If you want to learn how to, to jump from here to here to here to here, you have to you have the twilight zone. Right? You have to actually do it before the muscle memory. What do they say? Um, they say 90, how does it go? Uh, to develop a new, train a new muscle memory habit with nerves and chi takes 90 days. How does there, there's a formula that's now out there. Malcolm Gladwell, I think, has it. 90 days in order to, to actually... Uh, get it to where it's, it's now yours, right? Whatever it is you're trying to teach. So, where did we launch into? We launched into a place of reliance and vigor. This bodhisattva is now vigorous, and with his increasing vigor, he's ready to graduate, and he's working harder than ever. He develops his wisdom. Okay, so far so good? How are we doing? All right. Think about, okay, today, wow. Uh, in our camp, right, we, our family camp today, there's a lot of family campers in the room, in the back of the room. They're all reading and doing homework. Good for you guys. Okay. So, what did we do? Man, there was a lot of, our, our, our menu of Dharma treats served up in our banquet of Dharma is extensive menu, a lot of stuff. And uh, Jinwei Shu and I were the first ones to talk to the adults. We had our adults group here in the Buddha Hall while the kids went elsewhere and the youth went elsewhere. And we did a big round table. And there were, did you count, 20, 20 adults? And I said some stuff. And I found myself going to vegetarian. I went to diet right away. Didn't expect to at all. And here I am talking and I, I said, I'm not going to preach it. I really don't want to preach it. Um, and then we went around the circle. Jin Weisher talked about uh, going to visit his parents in Florida and how they had changed since he became a monk, particularly his mom. And uh, 
Then we went around the circle and everybody spoke. Everybody introduced themselves, name, birthplace, how long they'd been in this new place because we clearly saw in the room nobody came from here. Every single one of the 20 plus people in the room came from somewhere else. We are all immigrants. There was not a single Native American in the room. We're all from somewhere else. How long have we been here? And what did you hope would happen by attending our family camp? That was really rewarding and, and fascinating. One person said, I am an environmental, I'm a passionate environmental activist because I know that 50 years from now, none of this is going to be here. And my kids are going to suffer from it. It's like, oh, okay. And another mom said, I'm really concerned about the baggage that one generation carries when they're trying to communicate to the other. Is it real? Do we, can we get, let, let go of the baggage? You know? And that was really good. And others talked about communication and just how to, how to get their... She has three teenage daughters and she doesn't know how to talk to them because they're like aliens now. And, and so how do you communicate to an alien sitting at the breakfast table? And, you know? So it was really good to hear all of these <coughs> different different needs that people bring when they come to Buddhism. Right? It's a Buddhist place. And nobody asked about the Pure Land. Because uh, why? How do you explain that to a kid? It's a family camp. The Pure Land story is a story for people who have already experienced a lot of cool, and they're looking for a place that is li cool. Right? If you're telling a kid, you know, the world's full of suffering. Oh yeah? What's for lunch? It doesn't, you know, don't, and you try to force a kid, you, you know, you're really going to suffer in the future. Mom, you, you lay down, mom, you okay? You know, it, it's not, they're young, they're full of chi, you know, energy and youth. Pure land is for people who have looked ahead, <laughs> who have looked around and noticed that a lot of people are not here, who were here years before. And you recognize that people are falling off the planet, left and right, in horrible ways. Is there a choice? Somebody says, oh, there's this Buddha, Amitabha. Recite his name, and there's a place that is Bu Ku, Jila. Shurjia, the place of utmost joy and happiness. So that's, you know, so okay. So the family, the moms and the dads come to the Buddhist family camp with a whole bunch of other questions. How do I talk to my kid so that they understand? And so we say, oh, we got a sutra lecture for you tonight. <laughs> Guess what? This Bodhisattva is a master communicator. He, she is a da fa shi. Does that include talking to your alien kids over the orange juice and toast? It does. You know exactly what not to say for them to get it. Okay, now, here's an example. Oh my goodness. I came down the stairs. It was, we started at, at 9 o'clock, came down the stairs at 5 to 9, and I walked down our hallway from the stairway to the Buddha hall I walked past three moms and kids, and all three moms said, Oh, Dharma Master. They grabbed their children's hands and pushed them together. And they said, Here, put your palms together for the Dharma Master. And the kids' faces were, <laughs> Why? And it was like, Oh, mom, don't do that. You're not going to get what you think you're going to get as a result of forcing your child to, to assume this posture because here comes the monk. What they did was they made the child understand that when the monk comes, you do something, you're forced to do something you don't want to do that's uncomfortable. That's a bad start, you know. That's not, that's not the basis that we're hoping for the kid to go, who's, oh, why are you wearing that? Who's this? You know, and then it's like, oh, this darn, 
oh, you know, open to like, what are you about? That's, of course, they're going to see this as unusual, right? But we want them to go, huh, instead of, you know, as soon as, and I, I notice as soon as the monk comes, mom gets really uptight. You know, that's the, that's the lesson, that's the message. So I said, my contribution to the circle was, stop that. Don't do that to your child when the monk comes by. Just don't, you know. What works? Well, now, do we not want the kid? No, if the kid wants to put his palms together, and the other one that moms do, they take the child's head and push it to the floor. Here's the monk, bow, now, you know, and the kid's like, oh, oh bad, <laughs> wrong message. This is Buddhism, mom and kids. Yeah, this is your first lesson, your second lesson. Yeah, you get rug burns in your forehead because mom pushing you down, you know. So, what we're suggesting, please listen, because this is truly failure to communicate appropriate behavior in the monastery. What works better? What works better is based on the truth that kids have mom radar. And dad, moms do, dads don't do this. I haven't seen dads push palms together like that. Moms do it. Kids are tuned in to mom. I remember, I was there, right? And what are we tuned into? What mom is feeling. Is she happy? Is she uptight? Is she frightened? Is she focused, right? Here's what works, moms. If the monk comes by and you want to express, what, what word would you call it? Respect or interest in the monk? Put your palms together with sincerity and look the monk in the face. Omitofu, Fasher. Your child standing here will go, oh. How do you say it? Ami, uh, Amitabha? Amitabha, Fasher. The kid will try it. Because why? Monkey see, monkey do. If you're really uptight and you're nervous because here comes the monk and you force the kid, that's what you taught him. Monk equals nervous. Monk equals tension. Right? And worse, monk equals phoniness. Not genuine. Right? So, moms, particularly dads too, if you want the kid to grow up to be a, a perfectly behaving Buddhist, yi shan do it yourself. Be a role model first. The kid may or may not decide to follow you if he notices that mom is truly focused and sincere in her appreciation of being in the presence of a monk. But boy, I don't like walking down the hall and being the recipient of what we call pickle face, right? All these kids, all, one by one by one, they're like, the lesson as I walked down the hall was, God, here's the monk, everybody's nervous and uptight. Do I have to do that to be a Buddhist too? You know, fail. Failure of communication. So, wow, E. I suggest, that's a really good principle to follow in the monastery is show, don't tell. Right? Show your child how to be a Buddhist. What does it mean to you? The kid will pick it up 100%. Guaranteed way more effective than forcing their palms together or putting their head on the floor, right? That's really, wow, I've seen that, you know. Oh, the kid takes years to get past that, you know. So, our bodhisattva becomes, his, because of his vigor, her vigor, his wisdom grows even further. All right, and that's communication. Okay, now, what else? We got more here. We got another... Hypothetical. This one takes a page and a half to get to it. We're going to do the whole thing here. Are we ready? Are we on? We're at the bottom of page 80 and 81. Okay? Uh, it's then, uh, right? Here's our hypothetical. Ready? Let's do a... Uh, I'll just read this one to save our time. I'll just read. You can read along with me. 
，有不可说世界微尘数，诸佛众会，一一众会，有不可说世界微尘数众生。Turn over, page eighty two. 一一众生，有不可说世界微尘数性欲。彼诸佛随其性欲隔于法门，如一毛断处，一切法界处，悉以如是。如是所说无量法门，菩萨于一念中，悉能领受，无有忘失。Back to page eighty-one now. Here's the English. Okay. Disciples of the Buddha, when this Bodhisattva increases his vigor, he develops his wisdom. Then, supposing there were multitudes of Buddhas, as many as the fine motes of dust in indescribably many world systems, on the space of a tip of a hair, and supposing that in each of those Buddhas' gatherings there were as many sentient beings as fine motes of dust in indescribably many world systems, then. If each of those sentient beings had individual natures and wishes, as many as the fine motes of dust in indescribably many world systems, and then, if all those Buddhas individually taught them Dharma gateways according to their wishes and natures, right? We're still going here. And if, just as in that space on the tip of a single hair, so too it was the same throughout all places in the Dharma realm. The bodhisattva, in a single thought, would be able to completely absorb all those limitlessly many gateways to the Dharma that were explained without forgetting any. What a great student our bodhisattva is! What has what's the theme of this paragraph? Faman. Dharma gateways, otherwise known as Dharma doors. That's how we used to translate it. Gateways to the Dharma, entrances to the Buddha's practices. That's what it's talking about. So, look at what it says. This is a long, 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 long sketch. This could be a film, right? This is a setup for a for a story. Okay. So the Bodhisattva is vigorous. His wisdom is growing, and what does it give us? Here's the setup, right? You start with a. White piece of paper. We're going to sketch a setup here. Buddhas. Now it gives us a number for them. How many? How many motes of dust are there in a world system? Okay, we count that. Think of it in zeros. So a mote of dust would be what floats through the air when the sun slants through. Describably many world systems. On the space of a tip of a hair. So what is that? That's tiny. Okay, here's a the tip of a leaf, and a hair. I reach for my head. Isn't that ironic, right? So I reach for an eyebrow. There we go. So think about this tiny, and indescribably many world systems is the biggest. So the biggest now, in the smallest. So we've also got this breathing thing. Tiny, vast and tiny, vast and tiny. That many Buddhas, and okay, got that. Put that out there, and then we take a look. Supposing that in each of those Buddhas gathering, because where there's a Buddha, there's a group around them, like us here tonight. Okay, and the Buddhas are here behind me. Supposing in those Buddha systems there are as many sentient beings. Now they have an audience in our in our sketch. Okay, you're still following. I'm sure the young people in the back can picture this much better than the adults because you have to have an elastic imagination for this to happen. Okay, there's many sentient beings as fine motes of dust and indescribably many world systems. So now we we've kind of exponentially we've squared it times two, right? Flip over, then something's going to happen. Each of these sentient beings, just take one of them. Has a lot of xing yu, a nature and wishes. So something unique about the person, and then what they like. Just think of it that way, right? 
all of they have all of them have these particular likings. Okay? All right. Now the Buddhas that we already have posited out there are going to teach. What are they going to do? They're going to teach them how to cultivate. They give them Dharma gateways. What do you like to do? I like to cook. I like to make spring rolls and sushi. Right? Oh, good. Okay, well, we're going to give you the copper frying pan, copper bottom cookware. Now, let's see, you don't need a cookware, you don't need a frying pan for sushi or spring rolls. We're going to give you the, uh, the gold plated bamboo sushi turner, right? So, no. So, we're going to give you the, the um, for spring rolls, that, the perfect paper wrapper, you know. So, okay. The Buddha individually teaches them Dharma gateways that they can appreciate according to their natures and desires. And it says, like it was on all that vast universe on a single hair tip, so too, throughout the Dharma realm, everywhere, the Bodhisattvas on the ninth stage would be able to ling shou, accept, take in, and learn all of the the teachings being transmitted. Right? Here's an example. Um, every Sunday for the last six months in the Gold Coast, down in southeastern Queensland at our beautiful monastery there, I've been blessed with the opportunity to teach a meditation class. And that meditation class happened today although it's Sunday day there. It was in the morning. It's now, uh, we started this lecture at 12.30 on Sunday in Gold Coast, 7.30 on Saturday here in Berkeley. Okay, in that meditation class, there's a whole variety of people who come in. And Australia is like the United States. It's a melting pot. So in any given Sunday morning, I will have Lots of folks from Melbourne, lots of folks from Sydney come up, lots of folks from Cairns up in the north of Queensland, lots of folks from New Zealand, lots of Kiwis who come over. But then there will be people from Bialystok, <coughs> Poland, people from Romania, Hungary, people from uh, UK, lots of Brits there, lots of Irish who've come. Lots of Shanghainese, Malaysians, Singaporeans, the occasional Vietnamese, not that many, some from Guangzhou, Beijing, you know, Nanjing, Chongqing, uh, people from Taiwan. It's a very polyglot group, international group of people who've all come through Australia. And being in Australia, they thought, maybe it's time for me to learn to meditate. Maybe I've got to learn some Mindfulness here in this place. Good stuff. They come in and, okay, uh, we teach meditation. And we sit for 45 minutes. And the next thing that happens is usually I talk about technique. Who's got an issue in your meditation? What has been coming up for you? How's your full lotus? How's your half lotus? How's your chair sitting? Because... More than half of them prefer to sit in chairs. And fine, you know. So, we talk about that. And that's the hardware part. And then we go into the software part. What are you doing with your mind as you sit there? What's going on inside? The inside part of the meditation. We talk about, you know, sitting well and then what's going on inside. And sometimes people are willing to talk, sometimes they're not. And... Uh, we always invite people for lunch and we, we tell them about what's available on the campus after the, the class is over. They can go to the Arhat Trail, they go look at the new Buddha Hall, they can go up and take part in the Shanggong if they want to see a ceremony, bow. And, okay, usually there's, at this point, we might do a song uh, and there's usually half an hour, 40 minutes left. Two, we do two hour class. And then it's I, that's my chance to speak, right? 
to become the xiao fa shi, <laughs> not the da fa shi, I become the great Dharma master. And sometimes it's just a straight Dharma talk. Four noble truths. We're going to focus on the first noble truth, the truth of dukkha. What is that? Unsatisfying. We'll talk about that. Right? Other times you talk about the skandhas. Oh, what is, what is a human being? Other times we'll just tell stories. Right? The Buddha wasn't satisfied knowing he was going to die. The prince. He decided to take on mortality as his challenge. Whoa, that's a story. And we sing, Yashodara, look at where life leads. Sing that song. And sometimes we talk about Dharma gateways. And it's amazing to see different Xing Yu wake up. Say, huh, how many of you, when you meditate, recite a mantra? And there's usually like two individuals whose eyes are really wild and full of fire. I've been reciting Omani Padme Hum. Yeah, I love it. You know, I can't quit. You know. And okay, you know. And I say, I, I recite the Great Compassion Mantra. When I rec-. And they go, oh, really? You do? Oh, how do you do that? That's really interesting. You know, it's, it has to do with sound. What, you know, takes over like water. It just keeps on, without reciting, you're reciting, you know. And everybody else is like, a mantra? Oh, like... Uh, Oh, like that uh, Maharishi, right? Transcendental meditate, that one? Do you tell anybody what your mantra is? You're not supposed to, you know. So we have a little bit of connection to it. Many people like, I, I, don't, I don't know why you would do that, right? And we say, well, hey, do you count your breath? Well, I did, but it's boring. You know? Yeah, well, what do you do? I combine my meditation with yoga. I start with finding relaxation, I, let go of all the tension in my body. Very good. You know. What do you all do? Well, I just started, you know, nobody has said so far the Huato method, right? It's just they're not ready at this beginning meditation. That's our home method here, the Chan school. It's Han Huato, meditation topic. Who's mindful of the Buddha? Who is in there? But that gives me an opportunity to explain the Huato method, which I do regularly. And out of 20 people, three will get it. Go, mm-hmm, I want to know more. Right? So my point in telling the story is I'm a, I feel a lot like a gardener. And the first hour and 15 minutes of the class is kind of like spading up the ground or rototillering the ground. <laughs> chop, 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 chop. Right? The garden is the class, and I'm the gardener tossing seeds out. And those seeds, sometimes they bounce back, sometimes they dry out, sometimes a bird flies in and grabs the seed before it plants. Sometimes they go down, and this green sprout comes up out of the garden, and people start to, according to their natures and desires, start to meditate in different ways, right? I don't know if Ben is listening. I won't mention his name. It'll embarrass him. But Ben is now working on the Sharangava Mantra and wearing his precept robe, you know. And uh, I think a year ago, Ben didn't, you know, never heard the Sharangava. He's now listening to, to tapes and Master Hua's voice and memorizing, putting himself against Namo Sadan To Su Che Do Ye Ula Hudi San Meal San Pu. Mantra meditation, the longest, the king of mantras, right? Other people are discovering what? Guan Yin Bodhisattva. Meditating with devotion. Guan Yin Bodhisattva. They take one look at Guan Yin and something opens inside. I feel like I've known her a very long time, but I've really never seen her before. Well, how is that possible? You know, different gateways, Dharma gateways, open up at different times, and the garden has just been waiting to be plowed and sowed, right? And then it grows just like everywhere. So this is my experience in Australia, but it's the same in Paris, France. It's the same in Warsaw, Poland. It's the same in London, England. The same in San Jose, you know, 
we are we living beings each come with very different causes and conditions that bring us into the the light of the Buddha, the light of the Buddha's teaching. What is that light? It's not the Buddha's. It's the nature of a human being who took the covers off something that we all share, this Buddha nature. And yet it's each different and unique. And so here's our Bodhisattva, right? Who, this incredible analogy, what if, now suppose, it says, it gives us, paints us this amazing picture to show us what? How the Da Fa Shi, how the great Dharma Master moves us closer to our freedom from pain, closer to our liberation from suffering, and endless rounds on the wheel of samsara. That's what it is. Okay, so far so good. We following? The sutra, notice there's a progression here. It's training somebody to teach. And the lessons they're teaching are the greatest of lessons. Right? How real misery and suffering can, can end. And it points out that our Bodhisattva is a real good student. Right? Uh, the Bodhisattva in a single thought could completely absorb these limitlessly many gateways to the Dharma that were explained without forgetting any because he's going to be passing them on. Passing them on. Okay. That's it for now. Um, tonight, I'm going to be showing some pictures of the world that I've been uh, benefiting from and uh, completely absorbed in. And when I was uh, well, when I was in high school, I got involved in our yearbook, high school yearbook, and our school paper, the Thomas A. De Vilbus High School Prism, reflecting the world through in brilliant colors. That would have, no, how did it go reflecting, the, the, using some metaphor for prism, breaking, breaking, oh, yes, that's right, breaking school life into colorful news. That was it, the prism, by golly, and the yearbook, the uh, Vilvis High School, forget the name of the yearbook, embarrassing. So I first set foot in a dark room and got my hands into fixer, developer and stop bath and then larger and then in college uh, made a living actually doing the very same thing working as a darkroom technician with my future mentor who introduced me to Master Shrenhua David Bernstein and David if you're listening send me an email send me a text get in touch um, he became Bhikshu Hung Yo after leaving the dark room, coming to San Francisco. So that's where we met. And uh, photography was uh, a world that I found magical. I liked the frame that takes the flow of 360 degrees, everything going on, and goes, picture. Take a look. Here's what I saw. Right? It's light with borders. You just freeze out of the flow of everything that moment. And at the time, it was black and white. It wasn't color. But black and white has a power to isolate and to present something that goes deep when you share it. I love that part of being a photographer. And I, in 1969, managed to get a Nikromat camera in Japan and some good lenses and continued to, to photograph everywhere I went. Then uh, entered the monastery, gave my cameras and lenses to the monastery. Still as a layman, I worked in the monastery darkroom with Bhikshu Hung Yo. 
but uh, gradually separated from that experience of taking pictures. Uh, fast forward 30 plus years later, I'm in Queensland, living in a monastery, and absolutely gobsmacked by what my eyes were showing me. Because the, we're out in the outskirts of the Gold Coast, which is a long strip of cities, in what's called the bush, which is the forest. And the birds and animals and insects and snakes and fish, the creatures that live in the air and the vegetation and the land and the water, have not been disturbed since the dawn of time. Unfortunately, humanity has disturbed them a lot now, but they're, they're still intact, by and large. And simply by opening my eyes, I could observe and take part in the lives of things like kookaburras and currawongs and king parrots and lorikeets and brush-tailed possums and bush turkeys and pythons and small-eyed snakes and rough-scaled snakes and yellow-eyed whip snakes and orb weaver spiders and huntsman spiders and, and just by watching, suddenly I had shifted time zones from present to the Jurassic, you know. Uh, oh my goodness, it was wonderful. And so I thought, hey, get a camera. I want to share this. So I did. I grew up in Toledo, Ohio. You know, we had squirrels and rabbits and things like that, but not, not wallabies and, and uh, echidnas and wombats. We didn't have them. So what a, do- what a joy, what a delight to be able to just go snap and share what I was seeing. So I've, I've done that now and uh, reconnected with my, with my photographic background. But now it's digital, which is lovely. You skip the darkroom. You can still post-process, but we, uh, by and large, we skip the darkroom. So I'm going to share uh, this year's crop of amazing pictures tonight. And uh, this is the stills. I haven't processed a lot of the videos, the moving pictures. Those are coming in weeks ahead. So that's what's up next. Uh, before we, let's see, before we transfer merit, I want to ask for announcements now. Because we've got uh, things happening, like family camp tomorrow and... Do, we, do you have a list of stuff? Are you prepared to... Lots of activities this summer. Okay. So uh, we have family camp tomorrow, one more day, our second day. And so that should be a lot of fun. 9 a.m. to about 5 p.m. Um, and then I believe the following week, Jing Fosher was just telling me that we have a Sunday, a one day Amitabha recitation from. 8 o'clock to 4.30, to 4.30 p.m. So, so if you did, came, um, so tomorrow, six, six, so June 23rd, we'll have a one-day Amitabha recitation from 8 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. Following that, um, or during that period, we'll also have a retreat up at Suna Center, which I'm not sure if, it's, there's still registration open for that. If you're really interested in going on a retreat where we'll study Buddhist sutras with Western philosophy and meditation, um, you can come talk with myself and I can see if there's still space. And the following week, uh, we actually have a global Buddhist conference at UC Berkeley. And here we'll be having many, um, um, you could say, distinguished speakers Rabung Shur will be speaking, people know Ajahn Brahm. Um, there's other uh, Buddhists from all over coming to be part of this event. We'll have in the Bay Area probably something like 40 or 50 partners, Buddhist groups in this area, all gathering together to share what they're doing. And maybe 500 to almost 
potentially even like 2,000 people kind of coming to participate. So if you like to... Including, including Imi Oi. Imi Oi. Imi Oi, Sunday... Jing Xin Jin Gang. Sunday afternoon and um, 4.30 p.m. So that's a really great time to kind of come and, and participate in a Buddhist, you could say, festival and see Buddhist friends from all over, but also support Berkeley Buddhist Monastery. Yeah. Yeah, so I was about to say that. So the thing is, if you go to their website, which is aftermindfulness.com, I believe, or .org, you can find details of the conference and you'll see that they priced the ticket at $108, which is an auspicious number. And we have a BBM coach, I think it's BBM's GBC, like Global Buddhist Conference. And you type in the promo code and get 10% off. However, there's also another way to participate um, that the service space is spearheading, which is essentially saying that money is just only one form of wealth. Um, there's other ways that people can can participate in the conference and join, but they just they can share maybe by doing a, some acts of kindness. They said seven acts of kindness, and then you share the pictures, and that would be your you could say quote unquote ticket price. Or if you do eight hours of practice, so like Reverend Hongshur said, if you meditate every day for let's say an hour, and then that could be your that could be your you could say capital your gateway into the into their yeah. Dharma gateway. Dharma into, gateway. Yeah, your mm -hmm. Dharma gateway into the conference and to the Imi Ois concert. You just write a little brief reflection and share it with the conference. So you'll see that it's a little bit tricky to find on their website. You have to click on the community link and there's an unticket button. But come talk with us. We'll show you where it is um, because we think it's a really valuable experience and there shouldn't, there shouldn't be a financial barrier if you really want to participate. A lot of our community members will be going and, and sharing what we're doing. DRBU will show up very strong. Um, there's a three steps, one bow activity we'll be doing there as well on the campus, so that'll be an interesting thing. <laughs> so it's a great time. Um, that's June, I think, 29th and June 30th. Um, following that, we have Buddha Root Farm, and then a Guanin session at the Sitting Thousand Buddhas. And I think that's our activities here. A lot, a a lot, lot. of stuff. Oh, really? Tomorrow? Oh, tomorrow we also have the Buddhist nuns in the evening. So after our family camp ends, we'll have some Theravada nuns coming to do tea time. Ayananda Bodhi. So, yes, a lot of things happening. A lot. Um, so July 7th, do you know what time is that is? Uh, 3pm? 3? July 7th, that's, we'll have... That's the music. Yeah. Right. There's it's a 3. 3pm. July 7th, 3pm, um, we'll have a special concert here at Berkeley Buddhist Monastery with Imi Oi and other Buddhist musicians from the area to come and you can have a, a jam session or, or what, is it a formal conference or is it kind of... No. It's just kind of a chance for them to share music and, and be part of something. So if you're interested, please um, let us know and we'll make sure you get news about it. All right. Let me again uh, <coughs> express my gratitude to our tech crew, which makes us all possible on this side is Jerry and, and uh, layers of <coughs> hard work of other volunteers and on the Australian side, it's uh, Sam and Cliff who are doing the translation for China. And there's just so many hands involved in bringing this out to the world. So if it's that, that's merit. That's Gongda. So let's transfer that merit. Make a wish and send it out as far as your mind can go. That's how far it travels. Is the amp working, Chin Husher? May every living being 
our minds as one and radiant with light. Share the fruits of peace with hearts of goodness, luminous and bright. If people hear and see, our hands and hearts can find in giving unity. May our minds away to great compassion, wisdom, and to joy. May kindness find reward. May all who sorrow leave their grief and pain. May this boundless light dispel the darkness of their endless night. Because our hearts are one, this world of pain turns into paradise. May all become compassionate and wise. May all become compassionate and wise. That's a unique sound. So uh, we won't bow until the slideshow is over. So if we could turn the projector on and bring the screen down, we want you to see some pictures. Can we, somebody want to douse these? Do we want those on or does they matter? Doesn't affect it? Okay. Okay. All right. Well, we can begin. Bo Bohemia. And we present this in, on behalf of citizens of Hong Kong who are engaged in a strong, important, struggle at the moment. It's the national flower of Hong Kong surrounding me down in the Gold Coast. This is called Bird Dreams because this is kind of the very unconscious moment. And then the next thing that happens makes it even more vivid. There it is, original. But I like that this is kind of, you know, in the midst of samsara, Seeking liberation, you know. Wings extended, sometimes upside down. Notice this guy is Dao Xuan, Jie Dao Xuan, right? Okay. Rainbow lorikeets. This is a symbol of consistent, sustainable vigor, right? That's my backyard going up the hill. In the rain, the Buddha keeps meditating. Here is, that's, you don't see the kookaburra like that. This is a piece of veggie ham here. And this is Ali the kookaburra coming in to grab it and take it off and feed it to his boy. When he's raising his kids, he doesn't eat first. He eats later. All the, all the ham I put out there, he takes off to his kid. 
Got it. His feet never touch the railing. <laughs> so there's this true story that if you're eating at an outside cafe and sidewalk cafe in Australia, be careful. If you go to talk and you leave your sandwich in the air, <laughs> they come right by and you don't even know it and you go back and... <laughs> A kookaburra has been there and removed the sandwich from your hand. These are rare. This is a red-tailed, glossy, black cockatoo. And notice what they're eating. Those are called casserina nuts. And I'm told that those exist in China. Anybody know what those are called in China? Somebody here was telling me today when they were kids, they threw them at their little brother. But what a strange bird. The wingspan of this bird is vast. They're like this. They're giant. And this is what they eat. They eat one thing, casserina seeds, all day long. And you, you hear them first. What do you hear? As they, that huge beak bites down on casserina seeds. That's really the color of rainbow lorikeets. Notice the stair steps going up one, two, three here. We're blessed with a wildlife park just down the road called Corumban Wildlife Sanctuary. And they, they've been there for, for, what, 30 years now. And uh, they've got a, a wonderful thing going because these are wild lorikeets that come twice a day. They come at 8 in the morning and 4 in the afternoon and just show up. And so the wildlife sanctuary uh, minders hand people trays, little, little plate, like a tin pie, plant, pie pan, and they take a pitcher and they pour out this mixture of honey and nectar and water. And, and you stand there and you hold it up. And if they're ready, not every time, but if they're ready, the lorikeets come down by the hundreds, wild birds, and land on your head and land on your pie plate and land on your wrists. And they're perfectly happy to gobble down this yummy stuff while you're holding, you know. And I took these pictures because there were crows circling. And if the crows are circling, the lorikeets don't come down. But then they do. Then they come down and gobble, gobble, gobble. They're almost too colorful to believe. How could this be real? You know? And of course, they screech and squawk and make wonderful sounds of joy as they devour the goodies twice a day. Oh, that's a duplicate. Oh, that's not a lorikeet. That's called an orb weaver. It's about as big as the palm of your hand because they put themselves in the center of a spider web that is truly a miracle. Nine feet in some cases. So from here to here, and the, little sp the spider this big is in the center, right? And they weave that in about 45 minutes. And it's perfect. It's absolutely geometrically perfect. The angles, the, the geometry is perfect. And then they wait, and the sun rises, and they climb up to a tree and wait for the sunset to fall again. They come back down. And when you walk in the dark in this part of <laughs> Queensland bush, you take a stick and you swing it in front of you like this because you can very easily walk right into a web. Here is my friend Ollie. This is fifth year of getting to know him. We had long conversations. Oh, this is Percy the Possum. This is called interspecies communication, right? It's 
Sam took this picture. Oh, some of our possums have avocado on their nose. <laughs> this is called the avocado nosed possum. Avocado no- the southern Queensland avocado nosed possum. It's a new species. <laughs> uh, the wedge tailed eagle, apex predator. She's one of our uh, zoo minders, zookeepers there at Corumban. Corumban Wildlife Sanctuary has a great, it's called a free flight bird show. And you go in and they show off their wonderful birds. Okay, that's all of that one. Got another one here for you. These are a bunch of the really unusual critters. We went, oh, there we go. Five points if you can name that one. You may know? Wombat, five points. Who was that? Who said it? Alice, five points to Alice. That's a wombat. A wombat, a wombat. They're amazing critters. This is a wombat bowing to the Buddha. Only in my imagination. Okay, pause together. Close your eyes. Okay, five points if you can name that one. Australia's largest bird. Maybe the world's largest bird. Actually, ostriches can be bigger. Anybody know? It's a very dangerous bird. It will kill you. And recently did. A farmer got ripped apart. This is called a cassowary. Cassowary. And you can't see its feet in this photo, but the feet are clawed and powerful. They only live in northern Queensland, up near Cairns, Daintree National Forest. And they are as strange as you can imagine. Look at that headdress, right? They think it's designed to push through a forest, but they're not sure. And, interestingly enough, just before I left, I got an invitation, next time I'm there, to go spend time at a farm stay in Cairns where cassowaries live. Wild. So I'm looking forward. We're going to, Sam and I are going to go hang out with the cassowaries. Barking owl. They bark. Yep. Check those claws. Good eye. There you go. Right? Lots of owl species in Australia. No! Somebody's got a barking owl on their glove. (laughs) Friends visiting from London. Oh! That's a plaster stork. It's not a real stork. This is Kevin and Eleanor. Kevin and Ellie with a plaster stork. It's Dr. Wong. Oh, oh, oh. Totally as cute as you, can, as you think, right? Koalas really deliver in the cuteness department. They are really cute. Unfortunately, they are endangered now. They say there's only 8,000 of them left in the wild. And why? Traffic, dogs, and habitat destruction. You cut down their trees, they have to come down to the ground. Once they're on the ground, the dogs and the cars get them. So, uh, Corumban Wildlife Sanctuary has a wonderful hospital. It's one of the best in all of Australia. They see over 500 koalas a year. So, more than one a day comes in injured or savable, but not always. Right? I mean, look, 
you know. That's just a, they're, they're, they're woolly. You, when you give them a hug, they're, they're woolly. Oh, Tasmanian devil. I guess I could have given five points for that one, right? Probably nobody would have got it. Truly a Tasmanian devil. There he is. Notice his tooth sticking out there. What an un- They live underground, so their whiskers are that long. They need them because they're always going through a tunnel. Right? Oh, this is the blue-winged kookaburra. There's only two kookaburra species in the world. This is the other one. This is the blue-winged kookaburra. They're in the kingfisher family. Look at that beak. That's designed to grab snakes. So this, you hold the snake out here and bash its head against the tree branch and it can't bite you. That beak has got a function. Stork. Largest beaked bird in the world. You think, who planned this one? Was this planned by committee? Koala. And you all know, right, it's not a bear. People say koala bear. It's not a bear. No bearness about it. It's a marsupial. It's got a pouch. Oh, this is a goanna, G-O-A-N-N-A. Check out those claws. There's goanna. There he is. This is a monitor lizard. Australia has wonderful critters like this, wandering around. Oh, a blue tongue. Lizard. Sir, you got a snake in your rafters. Look at this, that's a python. They're not venomous. They're not angry or aggressive. They just like to sleep. One in three houses in Queensland has a python in their roof. But they're nocturnal and so you don't know it, right? One out of three houses has got one of these upstairs and you don't know it. Not as big as this. That's a big, those are two large pythons. There's one python sleeping, right? Want to wake him up? <laughs> they mostly eat rodents. Here's, you wouldn't notice that snake until you look carefully. Five points. This is, this is an esoteric one. Anybody can name this one. You get, we'll give you ten points for this one because it's rare. Quokka. Q-U-O-K-K-A. This is a quokka. They smile. When you look at them square on, they smile. Like that. That's how they smile. Right? That's not a quokka. That's Ellie. What's that? In Australia, there's all kinds of wildlife. Here's one of them. <laughs> yeah. Quokka. Oh, I think that's all. I think that's the end of the slideshow. It is. Back to the wombats. Okay, so these are just some photos, and we've got movies next week. These animals move. Lots of brush turkeys and king parrots and kookaburras and currawongs. You haven't seen those yet, so that's coming up. Okay, thanks for indulging me. Who wouldn't just want to share these images? Because these are they live. These are my neighbors. You know. And here in Berkeley, we got crows, we have cats, we have possum, uh, let's see, raccoons at night. That's pretty much it, because we're in the middle of a city, right? And now, mind you, you can be in Australia and not see any of these creatures if you're in downtown Brisbane, you know. But uh, all you have to do is travel into the brush, and there they are. Okay, can we run the screen up, and I'll...
turn the projector off and we'll bow to the Buddha and see you all tomorrow or next week. Omitofu. Thanks again for translating, Cliff and Sam. How many? Okay, ready to bow. Jerry, how many on YouTube tonight? 56, 51 to 56 on YouTube, 28 in China, and quite a few folks here. To the Venerable Master. Namo. <laughs>